Okay, so good evening everyone and I'm Dr. Zainab Mohammed, uh, Chair of Spice Root Pakistan. Uh, on behalf of the Spice Root team, uh, which is uh, includes Dr. Dhuri Nishad, Dr. Noor, Dr. Kashif and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Akhtar, I would like to welcome all the participants to our third lounge session of the Spice Root. Uh, before we formally begin, I would request all the participants to go through the general instructions in the chat box also. Uh, without much delay, I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Romeo Rajput, who uh, has done MCPS, who has done MCPS and is currently enrolled in a master training course at UHS Lahore. He's also a practicing. Let me just mute all. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry for the interruption. Okay, so before we formally begin, I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to go, uh, all the participants to go through the general instructions, the chat box. Uh, I would like to introduce our first pre our presenter, Dr. Romeo Rajput, who has done MCPS and is currently enrolled in a master training course at UHS Lahore. He's also a practicing specialist family physician at, uh, at Abzal Medical Complex. Uh, and today he will be giving a talk on a very interesting and a practical topic uh, on the untold secrets of how to uh, make a GP out of a doctor. Uh, also, we have with us our esteemed list of panelists, which includes Dr. Tariq Aziz and Dr. Hina Javed. Dr. Tariq Aziz is a member steering committee at the University of Health Sciences Lahore. He's the president of Pakistan Association of Family Physicians and also the president-elect of Wonka South Asia. Dr. Hina Javed is currently the assistant professor at the Department of Family Medicine at University of Health Sciences Lahore. She's a visiting consultant in Fatma Memorial Hospital. She's conducting a restructured master training course at UHS and also managing telemedicine center at UHS Lahore during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, for which she has received massive acknowledgement and praises for her efforts. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Romeo, Dr. Tarek, and Dr. Hina to this platform of lounge, uh, where our young GPs uh, come, interact, and uh, learn. Over to Dr. Romeo uh, for his presentation. Dr. Romeo, you can now uh, start uh, sharing your screen so that everyone can view your presentation. And uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome, Dr. Tarek, Dr. Romeo, and Dr. Hina, and all the participants. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, as she has already mentioned, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to make a GP out of a doctor. Uh, it is not a teaching session. Uh, my presentation is about raising some concerns, uh, some of which are less serious, the others are a little more serious. So when we are a doctor or we are under training to become a general practitioner, it all sounds very nice that you have learned how to diagnose a patient's condition and what medicines to give. But when we learn how to become a general practitioner, we start to learn about how to take the person's socioeconomical background and take all the details, like take the person as a whole, not just the condition of the patient you are going to deal with. It all sounds very good to start with until you start doing all these things for real. Then you come out of your training and you start practicing as a general practitioner. You realize it's a new world altogether. There is not much help and support out there. And even your seniors, they don't warn you about what to come. It's not because they don't want to tell you what is going on. It's mainly because what I realize is that many of our teachers, they're not even practicing as general practitioners. And even the ones who are practicing as general practitioners just started a long time ago. So they don't realize that, you know, when you start the new general practice, what kind of problems you're going to face. Okay, if when you get, do not get so much help from there, then obviously you turn to other resources like Google. 
So when you search up on Google and try to find some answers, like when you're starting up your own general practice, there are so many models that you will find on Google, but they mostly relate to other countries like USA. They don't usually relate to how we work in Pakistan. And when you start to practice as a general practitioner, so paying the bills should be the least one of your worries. But I have seen that many times you have to worry more about paying the bills than worry about the patients you're actually seeing. And on the other hand, like many problems you face from the government institutes, the utilities and the facilities and the bills you have to pay. So the major issues, I think, when you start your own general practice are the financial issues, the competitive market, which is very tough because all the quacks you are surrounded by, your own physical and mental health, the time for your family and layer, your personal development and growth, and dealing with the government organizations. The list is quite long, but today for each one of these, I think we need a separate section. So therefore today I'm going to talk about only one of the issues, which is the financial issues. So today I'm starting my presentation with this question that how cost effective it is to be an ethical general practitioner in our part of the world. I'm sorry, these next three slides are a little busy, but I'll try to explain what is going on here. The very first slide you can look at is about the clinical expense. Expense of your clinic, like when you start your own clinic, obviously there are different expense you must maintain, like you have to pay the rent, the bills. I've, I've done these calculations very basic, like rent is 25,000, all the bills of uh, gas, electricity, etc., 15,000. Salary of your staff, only three people, nurse, dispenser, and the helper, their basic salaries, the medicine you might have to purchase. And the monthly expense comes to about 103,000. I've given the conversion in US dollars as well if there are any inter international participants. So when you translate it into our daily expense, it comes to around rupees 3,900, which is about 24 US dollar. In all these expenses, I have not included my own pay, the sales taxes, income tax. I have also excluded any AC heating charges, any commuting charges to your work, place of work, USP generator charges, or any miscellaneous charges. So this much money you have to make every single day just to make your clinic alive. So if you are charging a single person at rupees 300 per patient. I've taken this number after looking at how much routine GPs are charging for a patient. So where I'm working in 45 minutes walking distance, there are about 14 GPs and the highest charging GP charges 300 rupees. So I've taken the highest charge out of these 14 people, 14 GPs. Okay, if you're charging 300 rupees per patient, to make this much money in a day, you must make you must see over 13 patients in a day. If you are spending about 15 minutes on a consultation, that translates to about three hours and few minutes. Okay, if you decrease your time and you spend about 12 minutes on a patient, you have to spend two hours and this many minutes every day just to keep your clinic alive this basic amount you have to make. Okay, this is assuming that you are working six days in a week, every week, and have no other holidays throughout the year. Okay, the next slide, this is a similar slide, similar calculations. This is about if you have three kids going to school, how much basic money do you need to make to send them to school? Okay, for these three kids, this much money you need to have for your school, basic fees, tuition fee, school fee, books and uniform. It all comes to this every month. And daily, when you divide this by how many days you're working, you get this figure. This much you have to make every single day. And this does not include if you need to buy a laptop or pay for the internet charges, any miscellaneous fees incurred by the school or any extra activity activities of your kids or the support, sports, et cetera. Again, to make this much money, if you're charging 300 rupees per patient, 
you need to see these many patients in a day. If you translate this to the time, how much time is needed to make this much money, you need three hours and these many minutes every day just to make this much money, just to make your kids go to school. If you decrease the time per patient to 12 minutes per consultation, you need this much time every single day to make this much money. This is again assuming you are working six days a week and have no other holidays whatsoever. This is the last slide in my calculations. For your basic food and shelter, again, very basic calculations, rent of a two bed portion, 35,000 rupees, basic bills of your house, about 15,000, that's all inclusive gas, electricity, all the charges, telephone, etc. For your kitchen, 1,000 rupees per day, $6 a day, and your total expense is this much, and you must make this much money for your food and shelter every day. From these expenses, you will again note that I've excluded all the bills for air conditioning, heating, a car you might need, pay for your maid, eating out, entertainment, clothing, special occasion, etc. Again, with the same calculations, if you're charging 300 rupees per patient, you have to see these many patients every day, and that translates to spending two hours and these many minutes at the rate of 15 minutes per consultation. And again, if you decrease the time to 12 minutes per consultation, you have to spend two hours and these many minutes. Again, assuming you are working for six days a week and have no other holidays whatsoever. Okay, in this slide, what I have done is I have added up the expenses, the bare minimum expenses of running your basic clinic, your kids' basic education, and your basic housing. When you add all the times, as I have calculated in the previous slides, it translates to nine hours and 25 minutes. Okay, we are human beings, so I don't think it's possible to work on the throat for nine hours and 25 minutes without a break eating and drinking. So I've added one hour's lunch break in the middle and three minutes for commuting, which I think is very reasonable inside a city. So this translates to 11 hours and 25 minutes of your time every single day. If you are giving 15 minutes to every patient, if you decrease the time to 12 minutes per patient, again, with the same calculations, you have to spend about nine hours and these many minutes every single day just to make both ends meet, okay. In this, again, I have not included any tea breaks, coffee breaks, refreshment, washroom breaks, no time for webinars, for get-togethers like ours today, any seminars or CMEs, etc. Okay, just to give you a flavor again, the things we are missing out after working for so long are, in case if you need any emergency days off or you fall ill, you hit the wall, you can't work after so many long days and you need a couple of days rest, you don't have any backup, okay? If you need heating and air conditioning in your clinic or your house in our part of, of the world, it becomes necessary, but we haven't included any billing for that. Any power backup, you know, we have power shortage, so sometimes there are power backups. You might need a UPS or a generator. We don't have any money to pay for that. And for family needing any specialized healthcare, for the basic needs, maybe we are able to treat them at our clinic. But if they need any specialized healthcare, you don't have any additional money for that. And for your kids, if they need any money for extracurricular activities, you don't have any expense. We haven't included I mean, TV bill, cable bill, internet, which is a bare necessity. We all need a mobile phone bills. We definitely need that. Any family outing, entertainments, any clothing, grooming, toilets, we're missing out on all these things. And if there are any special occasions, birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, I mean, there is a huge list which I have left out. And again, when you have to pay taxes, your sale taxes, income taxes, we don't have money for that. And if you're falling short, we don't have any backup plan, we don't get any subsidy, anything from any institute or from the government at all. Okay, again, when we are working for hours like 11 and a half hours, 12 hours a day, the basic calculation I have done is for a single shift. 
what if you are working for longer hours then obviously you'll have to hire more people because nobody's going to work for you for 12 hours every single day for the basic pay of eight hours a day so you'll be needing additional salaries there is no backup as i have mentioned before for your family for yourself if you need a specialized health care you should have to pay for your mortgage there's no mon money for your mortgage either but we have calculated the rent money before it might be exchangeable uh, with the rent money but again you need some money to put that deposit to start with no money for the car loan at the end of all this you're working like a robot all your life and once you retired the irony is you're left with nothing at all the no retirement funds no pension nothing at all but we are human beings we must live we need to survive and i have thought of some possible solutions by doing which we could possibly make the both ends meet so these are some of my suggestions which we possibly do like give more time to your practice or you could increase your charges like the money you charging from each patient you could reduce the time for consultation for example instead of giving 15 minutes you give 5 minutes per patient and you see more patients make more money or you could compromise on children's education do not send them to good school send them to cheaper school or you start taking share from labs like all the labs you write for your patients cbcs etc or you start taking share from all your referrals like when you spend a patient to some specialist and you take a cut from it or other things like people come nagging you like buy us stuff the pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals and just take share from that and thinking in retrospect just to make uh, things more palatable perhaps one could travel back in time and marry a partner who could share the burden with you and make some money for you okay what i'm going to do is discuss each one of these options one by one on each slide i've discussed each one of these options and i've tried to work out how feasible it is to make additional money by one of these options so the very first option from the top of the list was give more time to your practice okay if you look at the time you're already spending working at six days a week if we give 15 minutes to a patient we are spending around 69 hours every week just to meet the bare minimums at 12 minutes per patient if your consultation time is 12 minutes per patient you're spending about 60 hours every week okay what does that mean 69 hours a week or 60 hours a week is this good or bad when we look at the modern world they usually work for from 9 a.m to 5 p.m that is five days a week there comes to around 40 hours so i've tried to look up at the internet and done some basic research on the European countries, the European in the European countries, from about 35 minutes to 45, 35 hours to 45 hours is one full week. That is called a full-time job if you're working from 35 hours to 45 hours a week. And that must include they see daily minimum rest period and compulsory holidays. So some way you get annual holidays, some way you get six monthly holidays some places you get quarterly holidays but we haven't included any holidays at all so the effect is twofold it's not only we're working for long hours we're not getting any additional holidays at all so by the end of it you surely bound to fall ill or hit the wall somehow okay even after working for these hours if you're doing any additional hours i'm talking about the western world european countries for your additional work hours, you get 25% to 50% extra pay raise. You get the raise for the extra hours. Throughout the world, if we look at the longest working hours, the Chinese regime, which is famous as 996 Chinese regime, which means working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six days a week, that comes to 72 hours per week. This is called the toughest regime in the world. If you look at the 72 hours and our 69 hours, we are already working at the toughest regime. So I don't think it's feasible for a human being to give any additional more time to your general practice. Let's move on to the next option. Okay, the next option is increase your pay. Okay, just to give you a flavor of what 300 rupees means, 
for a common person. Remember, I mentioned three people who work at her clinic, the T-Wire clinic cleaner, who gets paid around 267 rupees every day. So the, your 300 translates to his daily wages plus 12% of his next day's wage. Again, if you work out the daily wage of your dispenser, which is about 500 rupees, you charging him 60% of his daily wages. And for your nurse, again, who is getting paid 667 rupees, you're charging 45%. Let's see what happens if you raise our charges. Let's consider if you're charging rupees 500 for every consultation, what difference is that going to make? For your tea boy or your cleaner, the multitasker boy you have hired, he will be paying you around two days of his wages, just under two days of his wages. And the dispenser, he will be paying you his complete daily wage just to get himself checked. And for the nurse, she will be paying you 75% of her daily wages. Again, this does not include if you write him a prescription, the person has to buy any medicines, that is all extra charges. And if God forbid you are prescribing or advising an investigation, that is all on top of it. So from my point of view, if you are not catering the elite, you are relating the general population, I think 300 rupees is already more than what it should be looking at these figures, 112% for your multitaskers pay. Let's look at the next option, how feasible that is, excuse me. Let's consider if we reduce the timing who we'll give per patient, because if we reduce the timing, that obviously means you can see more patients in a given day. Let's look at how other countries are doing, how much time they are spending per consultation. If you look at USA, Sweden, Bulgaria, they give about 20 minutes plus. I think top of the list is Sweden. It comes around 22 minutes plus. We're talking about the average time, the average time they spend per consultation. Again, if you go to Europe, look at the Scandinavian countries, Central Europe or Eastern Europe, these countries, they're also spending about 15 minutes plus per consultation. Look at Russia, they're both spending more than 18 minutes. Canada, they're spending more than 16 minutes. In UK, the average time used to be just less than nine minutes. They were spending more than nine minutes per consultation. But recently, Royal College of General Practitioners of UK from 21st of May, 2019, they have decided that 10 minutes is not enough for a good consultation. And the reason they've explained behind that is that most of your people, they'll have more than one presenting complaint. And since my training as a GP, I have also realized that once you start taking the patient in his social, economical, psychological context, there's so many other things you have to look after, not just a single complaint the person has come in with it. So the RCGP, Royal College of General Practitioners, they have decided that the minimum consultation time should be at least 15 minutes. So the, by the end of 2030, all the consultations in UK, they'll have average consultation time of 15 minutes. So I don't think it's a very good option decreasing your time any further. We're already playing at 15 minutes and 12 minutes. Okay, let's look at the next option. Let's compromise on our kids' education and see what happens. I was thinking, which are the best institutes? The best in institutes in my city of Lahore where I'm living. So some of the things that come to my mind are the good colleges like HSN College, uh, Learning Alliance, Foyba School, Shurfat, uh, Lahore American School, Likas, Chanbagh. The cheapest one of these was Chanbagh. They charge more than 30,000 rupees, which is much more than what we have worked out. We have worked out our children at 18,000 rupees fees, where my kids are going. Uh, sorry. Again, this school is on the outskirts of Lahore, about 45 minutes travel, and you have to pay for commuting and all that. And from my perspective, from my point of view, if I'm not sending my kids to the best school, I think I'm already compromising on my 
kids education i would like to compromise on anything else but i don't think it would be a good idea to compromise on my kids education at all to some extent if you know sending your kids to the best school maybe maybe you consider you already compromising but i don't say i'm compromising but at least i can't go any less than where i am already i already am let's go to our next option let's consider what happens if you take share from the lab i've given a list of like how much share you can make from each of the labs let's look at the top labs like the most famous labs in pakistan aga khan shobat khanam al razi all these labs they don't give you any share if you take sample at your clinic and you send them your sample they won't give you any share the second best lab labs like chuktai we all know like if you open up the collection center they might give you 25% charges and if you go to less famous labs like zenith lab or city lab they might give you 25% to 45% and there are some other unknown labs they give you even more money like 50% and 60% i was posed this question by one of my colleagues saying what is wrong with taking share from the lab because if your patient is going to a lab they'll pay the same money you take your cut or you do not take your cut so why not you take your cut i asked him this question i said where would i send my patient to if i start taking the share from the lab will i send to a good lab where i don't get any money or would i send to the lab where i don't trust the result 50 to 60% so it's a very slippery slope and i think this is the reason our pmdc pakistan medical and dental council has decided that any doctor or general practitioner should not take any share from the lab there are other options as well if you playing with the labs for example there are some people they say if your clinic is producing around 5 tests per shift per shift means shift is in the morning and there's a shift in the evening so per shift if you writing five cbc test they give you a cbc analyzer you can keep at your clinic and basically you know the tests are good again with the biochemistry analyzer per shift you can give them like three tests per shift they give you biochemistry analyzer and you can be sure that there's nothing dodgy going on and basically you can make some money from there or other option is unknown less famous lab this is the roughly figures so i've done some basic background work to give you these figures so mostly people say give them around 10000 60 dollars of special tests a day the special tests are the tests which we cannot do by cbc analyzer biochemistry etc like you give them pcr test hepatitis b test hepatitis c test these all tests are called special test okay once you have reached these levels you can obviously negotiate with them that how much you would like to take but again with this there is a risk of over investigation like in a day in a morning session how many patients you are seeing maybe you seeing 25 30 patients and you must write these many tests in your shift so again there is a risk of over investigation if you going down that route then again there are many lab scams if you are not sending to very famous labs they doing all sorts of dodgy things i know some stories like people come and then they try to convince you that we give you lab and they ask them questions how do you make how do you make so much money that if you want to give me 50% obviously you are making so much money so how much how do you make money so they tell you all sorts of stories just to convince you like the kids they have the split them in half and two thirds so their spending goes to half or the spending goes to one third some guy was telling me about the, this esr jerk which i had never heard of before he says you get the esr tube and you double the amount of esr solution you put in there and you give like very vigorous jerk and you place it and you don't have to wait for like full one hour you'll get the result in 5 to 10 minutes and all sort of doji things they are doing and sometimes the labs they give you like false positive results so that you can refer them back for double checking or when you give the medicine obviously they'll have the test done again just to see how much improvement they are making so again taking share from the unknown or less known labs i don't think that is very much recommended there are other scams going on with ultrasound when you make the referrals they change the dates or all sorts of dodgy things i don't want to go into too much details many of us who are practicing as general practitioners know already most of these things
Okay, let's consider if we take referrals uh, from all the referrals we make to specialists. Uh, mostly the specialists that don't give you any referral money is like if I'm sending to a famous endocrinologist, I'm unlikely to get any share. Where do you get the share from? The people who have opened up small hospitals or small size polyclinics, they give you share and they're mostly run by non-doctors. The business minded people who have opened up the whole place and they say send us cases and we give you give you the cut. They give you pre-printed uh, pre referral forms. I'll show you on my next slide and you get the fixed amount of whatever they're charging during their procedure or the services they are providing. One of the guys, he came to me and he even said, we give you 20% 20, 20 per recommendation per patient that you're sending to us and it's negotiable. We might give you more money. And he proudly said that it's all tax free, that nobody knows about it. So you don't have to pay the tax. So I quite liked the guy because he was telling me all sorts of details. But by the end of our conversation, the guy did not like me very much. I'm not too sure why that was. Okay, so that was the referral form the guy gave me. On this, it says Dr. Des and they do normal delivery and uh, like cesarean sections and all sorts. You just write the patient's name and refer them and basically whatever they charge, it gives you 20% of all that. So these kind of things are also going on. And it makes me wonder why these things are going on. And I discovered that these guys, the business-minded people or non-minded people, they know that the GPs who are working as standalone GPs, basically they are facing loads of financial difficulties and they think all the GPs are easy targets. That's why they approach us. Like the guy, how he approached me, how I dealt with the guy, I was discouraging. So before he went to the next guy, probably it made him think again that if the next GP is again like that, I'm going to have a tough time. Okay, the next option is if you buy stock from pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. So thanks God, DRAP does not allow us to prescribe nutraceutical by brands. So nutraceuticals, obviously we can't buy now and we cannot recommend to patients by brands. So basically that option is out of the way. Okay, if you're buying bulk stock from pharmaceuticals, obviously they give us extra discount. But again, as a general practitioner, what are the most commonly prescribed drugs? I think the most commonly prescribed drugs are paracetamol and ibuprofen. Next in the line are antiallergic, antidiarials, ORS, cough syrups, some basic antibiotics like amoxicillin. They were all cheap stuff. The margin is not big in them, in them at all. The most profitable stuff where you can more, make more money, where they give you like more discount, the newer antibiotics or some drugs which have like questionable evidence like a camera recently we have all heard about them people selling them in the black and all sorts but basically they're not all our domain so we left behind for generally ppis anti-diabetic -di drugs etc but again you can't make a huge sum of money just by keeping these things at your clinics okay again when you're going to the pharmaceutical companies uh, the discount you, they offer you, the discount differs a lot. For example, if I'm purchasing a common medicine, which I prescribe quite often, like Nubral Fort, I won't get very much discount. If I'm selling a brand which is not very famous, they'll probably give me a little more, a little more basically percentage on that, sorry. So again, the pharmaceuticals, they are attacking you or trying to convince you in different ways. Some say we give you money up front, this is your money, we give you this share and you buy our medicine. Some say, okay, this general practitioner, you won't take the money. So they try to convince you, offering you extra favors. We buy you air conditioner, you don't have air conditioner at your clinic, blah, 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 blah. But you can open up your own pharmacy. This is a reasonable option but we'll talk about this later as well, opening up your own pharmacy. But again, if you're opening up your own pharmacy, you need your basic handsome amount of money from which you can open up your own pharmacy. Let's consider our next option. The next option is if you could really travel back in time, would you really want to marry a partner uh, who would like to share money with you? 
or other option would you would you think of maybe have less children if you have one child is instead of three you'll have to spend less money or maybe you would like to move abroad at a younger age you make more money have an easy life and one of the options that came to my mind when i was thinking maybe travel back in time and change things one of the option was changing my profession and becoming a businessman or somebody else so that i would have a much easier comfortable and financial hassle free life okay so far we have considered all the options one by one from out of the options to best of my knowledge or thinking or realization none of these are too feasible for making any extra money but i see all around me like all the doctors they have a happy life people have cars they sending their kids to abroad have their education traveling here and there so what is the magic lamp that we have how are we making all this extra money so most of us who are working as a general practitioner they know the answer to this question just to give you the answer in my next few slides i've copied these slides from a study published in british medical journal in 2007 so the next four slides are from this this paper that is published in bmj if you look at this slide on a vertical axis these are the countries and on horizontal axis we have consultation time the the gps are spending per consultation it's not the recommended time is the actual time they're spending on the top here are the countries i've mentioned like sweden usa bulgaria etc guess where we are countries like us pakistan india nepal Yes, probably you guessed it right. That's right at the bottom. That's where we are: Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. On this slide, this slide is basically from the same study. What they have done here is they have quoted different studies. If you look at this study right at the top, it's from Bangladesh. They studied two thousand eight hundred and eighty consultation in a cross-sectional study, and guess how much was the mean time? gp spend on a consultation not even a minute is 0.9 minute we translates to 53 seconds next to the 1 minute next to the 0.8 minutes which is even less 1 minute let's see what the other countries are doing let's look at india not a huge difference 1.9 minute per consultation 2.3 2 minutes 1.5 minutes let's look at nepal Nepal is a little bit better, three point five minutes, two minutes, and here we are in Pakistan, three minutes, four minutes, one point seven nine minutes per consultation, three point four minutes per consultations. To me, since I'm working as a general practitioner, there is no way you can give a good consultation in three minutes and basically solve all the problems a patient would come in with. so the question that comes to my mind why are people giving so little time for consultation i think it is the system it is the financial system that is pushing the boundaries and pushing the general practitioner to provide the substandard care in our part of the world okay so we have only talked about the financial issues today how the financial side of things make gp compromise the standard of care they are providing but trust me for all of these things which are which are earlier talked about competitive market physical health mental health all of these things are making gps compromise their standards i mean i could give a full presentation on each of these talking about the issues highlights but this this was the major issue financial issues okay obviously since we have all these problems we must do something about it so i was thinking you know what can we do without like decreasing the standards of care what can we do to make the both ends meet so these are the some of the recommendation or some of the things that come to my mind to make more money so instead of being a stand alone gp like you are a single person working at your practice like in uk and patient come to you and you prescribe the medicine and charge them 
the other things you can do, you could convert your GP clinic to a poly clinic. This is where I'm currently working on as well. I think it is, it, this is quite feasible. You get like other people coming to your clinic, like some specialists instead of referring to other places, you have specialists, so you get the share from them people. And that's, that is a good legit way of making the money without compromising your standard. Other ways you can start doing your own minor procedures as a general practitioner, we are allowed, we are trained, we can do these things like in CN and drainage, doing inter-articular injections. They don't charge you so much, cost you so much money, but you can make reasonable amount of money. You could get training or small diplomas, start doing these things, circumcision, et cetera. We could make some extra money from doing these things. Again, as I've mentioned earlier, we could open up our own pharmacy. If you don't have the money, I think uh, there are some initiatives from the government They help you out. You can take money out interest-free. You can do these things. Mm. You can add some general items into pharmacies like milk, powders, diapers, etc. I think these just all the pharmacies are doing these things as well. You could open up your own lab. Again, like I've said, you could help get help from the government or when you start your polyclinic, some of the uh, doctors with you probably they will be well off, they can spend some money and open up your own lab. You could start with other services like ultrasound or x-ray machine, you could install, make some money from that. Or you could increase your fee. That is also a possibility. Although you're going to have a very tough time because you're surrounded with quacks, the people who are affluent, they will still come to you, you charge more money and you have a discount policy for the poor. You can have a preset discount like 30%, 50%, whatever you think is feasibility, good feasibility. The other recommendations which I could think of uh, at the government level or the broader level, we could start opening up uh, clinics uh, at hospitals, BHUs where the GPs are employed and they're given a good salary, they can make the both ends meet and the general population, uh, they can get good treatment without the compromise of any standards. We could have government run surgeries throughout the country, like all the surgeries are run by the government and of individual GP clinics. We are all hired by the government and we get good salary at the end of every month. We could have public private partnership GP surgeries where we get subsidy from the government for seeing people at a cheaper rate. Uh, like Pakistani government is introducing health card. It hasn't reached us yet, but that sounds a bit promising. And NH style GP owned surgeries where the things are paid for by the government and GP run the surgery as a doctor and as a businessman and makes good money. Or we could have a USA style health insurance system where insurance pays for the thing and the GP doesn't have to compromise the standards. These are uh, some of the recommendations. Some are feasible, some are not so feasible. So I'm leaving it open at this place because we have expert panel do to very expert people in our field. So I will let them take the stage next and maybe tell us a little more which recommendation are feasible and which are not. If you guys have any questions and comments at this stage, uh, I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romeo. Thank you, Dr. Romeo, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we all knew that uh, running an ethical GP practice is very, very difficult in this country. But I think listening to you made it more obvious and realized that it's tougher than it what it actually sounds. I'll leave the room uh, for the question and answers. If there are any question answers in the chat box, I would ask Dure and Noor to look at it and then we can divert them to our panelists. We have Dr. Tariq Aziz and we have Dr. Hina to answer such questions. Uh, also, you can raise, uh, you can just raise I your think hand. You and will then have we can, to uh, we, un can unmute you. Dr. Tariq Aziz because I think he's speaking. Oh, sure. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. You made very good points, you know, but uh, ultimately a GP has to succeed because uh, he has to have some respect in the public life as well. 
So I suppose uh, if we gather around uh, the GPs who are practicing around you and we can gradually raise the fee structure, first of all, and all of you must raise the fee structure. 300 is very little and you, al you already have MCPS. You can go up to 800 rupees as mentioned in the BMDC statutes also. So uh, you can make a difference by putting your degrees up. You have so many certificates behind you. I suppose they're quite impressive there. And uh, the amount of fee you are charging should be more than 300 in the first place because you can't compromise on your life standards. You, you already said so much about that. So you can't really work more than that. I suppose there should be some rise and you must also talk to your GPs around you so that they can make a uniform rise in the fee. And especially those who, who have post qualification like MCPS or MRCGP, they can really make some difference uh, impressing their patients and uh, also looking at the other ways of earning money like you have suggested like a pharmacy you can also uh, add something uh, like house calls and uh, antenatal or postnatal care to it because uh, you, you can add an LVH or lady health visitor to cater for, the, for, for those things because you are trying to make a polyclinic now. So I suppose such things should be added which can add to your income. And basically, I really feel that you have done a lot of hard work to make a polyclinic. You must raise your fee structure as well. You must educate your patients. You have to give a quality service. Ultimately, the families just stick to you. No money, no, no matter how many people are around you practicing in a competitive condition. I suppose individual uh, efforts and then adding some nursing cares like antenatal, postnatal, or LVH or polyclinic, having some sort of uh, uh, percentage from the uh, surgeon or other people or eye specialists or ENT specialists adding to your polyclinic would really help you because that will channelize your patients to these uh, specialties in your on that and also uh, in the fee structure is very important you may collaborate with your colleagues who have MCPS in your vicinity because 300 nowadays is very little I know even an ordinary GP, he is charging 500 rupees, he or she, even at uh, with the level of MBBS uh, education or training. So you being MCPS and other people with uh, such a qualification should have a better fee structure, maybe at least 500, if not 800. That will cater to some of your deficiencies. And of course, you are also a master trainer. You have added qualification. So perhaps you can go up to 800 but you must also convince your patients with your qualifications as you've done in your clinic. I can see very beautiful certificates behind you. So impressing your, your patients and uh, gradually uh, brainwashing them for a better care, uh, running a polyclinic uh, and uh, with the support of your ENTI general surgeon, you can also have a percentage and plus antenatal postnatal care with a lady health visitor, if, if not lady doctor, you can really add to it. I suppose we need to give respect to our GP and especially those who are qualified like MCPS and MRCGP, I think um, we need to work hard on that. I, I think it is achievable. And, and other cities like Karachi, I suppose, they certainly charge more than that. Even in Lahore, I suppose people like you can raise your standards. And thank you for the wonderful presentation you've given. Thank you. Thank you once again. Dr. Zanib, over to you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hina, would you like to add something uh, uh, in Dr. Rohimer's presentation? Is it something that you would like to add on? And then we'll go on to, uh, we have like one or two questions in the chat box, and then we'll divert those questions to the panelists. Sure. Uh, Dr. Romeo, you certainly have the art of making a stark reality palatable. You've raised the voice for the entire GP land or most of the GPs, and you spoke clearly with a concept and you spoke from the heart and it did didn't seem like you were just reading out the slides. Um, you've said it was a unique and a wonderful presentation, I must say. What you have stated shows that a standalone community-based practitioner is vulnerable. That's what you've highlighted. And he, she must be protected from rampant fraud as well. So you've touched on a very sensitive topic in one of the most uh, diplomatic ways and decent ways, I, I suppose. And uh, so in a nutshell, 
they do need the backup from the government and and you very rightly recommended that and suggested that and i think that should be the way forward uh, trust me we are working on it on multiple levels so uh, all i can say is good luck to us um, there was an element of towards the end of the presentation there was an element of regret of becoming what you are and this is uh, again thank you for sharing that uh, and as, as I said, you were the voice of loads of GPs in the, in the country, not, not just speaking for yourself. So you gave them a voice. And I think it will be echoed far and wide. And I, I'm sure you will start seeing things moving in the right direction. But hats off to you for the presentation and raising the voice. And I would expect others to do it and learn from this. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, please? Uh, Dure, can you divert the question to the panelist? Okay. Uh, we have just one question. Uh, Dr. Aslam wants to ask uh, that are there any institutes which can uh, which offer train, uh, pr training for procedures like echocardiography or uh, colonoscopy? That's what she's trying to ask. Yes, such uh, a training can be had from the hospitals where we have family medicine departments. We can specially talk to people or we can arrange them if people are interested. Uh, in the past, we have had training for ultrasound and arranged such courses and also uh, like minor surgical okay. procedures. And especially there were sessions held in TIC Punjab Institute of Cardiology also regarding some uh, cardiac procedures also. So I think the people are interested, they can put up their demand. If we have a small group, then we can make arrangements for that as well. So, okay. Dr. Zainab, Dr. Hina wants to add to this question. Can you please unmute her? Right. Yes, I agree with what Dr. Tariq has said. Um, GPs are not specifically trained for colonoscopy or upper GI endoscopy or echo or any, any such procedures. Um, because they are the generalist and these things come under the specialty domain. But then there are uh, things like GP with a special interest in say cardiology, gastrointestinal diseases, so on and so forth, dermatology and oncology and so on and so forth. I know that doesn't exist, but that entity uh, exists in other parts of the world. And yes, if somebody is inundated and is working in an area where there are, there are lots of cases of GI bleeds or uh, duodenal ulcers and um, lower GI cancers and stuff, and he's and there is no other specialty around. Then they might be they might want to train it, but there is no obligation as such. It it is something that is dictated by an individual. Their self directed learning basically. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Hena uh, and Dr. Tarek for answering the question. Uh, well, I have one uh, question, basically. I, this is just surprises me sometimes. So I have this question to all three of you, Dr. Romeo, Dr. Tarek, and Dr. Hena. Basically, you know, it always surprises me that we are surrounded by quacks at all times, you know, in this part of the country, like in Karachi, in Lahore, like where we have like, you know, quacks in every, probably in every, every lane which are practicing like unethical GP practices that we call them, you know, they're doing like a mini, mini GP business, as we can say, like Dr. Romeo also mentioned all the kind of things and all the kind of pharmaceutical practices and all the laboratory practices that are being done. So how do you think, I mean, do you think, is there any uh, change in mindset that is required? Because, you know, our patients also, they tend to uh, get attracted to all those kind of practices. They fall for the trap. They go there and then, you know, they get treated also from there. And then once it once gets complicated and stuff, and then they find the right person and come to us. Or probably they end up, land, they end up landing in a tertiary care hospital with, you know, multiple complications. 
So do you think, is there any change in mindset that is required? And if, I believe if there is some, something of that sort that is required, then which, which is the right path that has to be taken in order to find the right GPs and uh, for like Dr. Romeo and all the other GPs that are doing the ethical practices and, you know, uh, wanting to serve the people. So, uh, yeah, that's the yeah. one question that I, just, just comes to my mind already. Can yes. I say Thank something? You very much. Yes, yes, sure, sir. Yeah, uh, previously we have worked a lot because uh, as an NGO, we went to the Healthcare Commission. They've made special rules and regulations, and uh, they also have a portal where we can report that we have a quack in our area. If we report that, then Healthcare Commission specially takes uh, a serious action against those people. And many a time, such uh, quackery uh, organized clinics have been sealed and they have been heavily penalized for that. But there is a law, and through the Healthcare Commission, any GP can report that in his vicinity or her vicinity, there are there is a lot of quacks, and they can namely uh, pinpoint those. And serious action has also been taken against them. We still have a portal in Healthcare Commission where we can report, and of course through the media and through our uh, uh, general discussions, we always try to discourage that. But quackery is a big menace which needs to be taken care of. And it is the government who can take care of it because GPs can't do it entirely on themselves. They can just make a silent uh, report, not disclosing themselves, and ultimately government takes action. So this is the only way because GPs, they are using steroids and other such uh, drugs which, which can have dramatic effects which, are, which a normal ethical GP can't really use. And they charge less, but they see maybe hundreds of patients a day so people getting multiple injections uh, in a single consultation, more than two or three injections every day, they have psychological effect. And one of them is definitely a steroid and a B complex red and white injections. And they get spontaneous improvement for the time being, although compromising on their immune system. So the best way is to talk to the healthcare commission or send a message at the portal there or make a phone call there and that can help and, uh, and try to raise your own standards and individually talk to your patients regarding ethical practice as well. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a very good suggestion what Dr. Tariq Aziz has mentioned, but I think there's an, there's an other answer to it. I think the reason the, the quacks are surviving in Corona, we have discovered that the viruses have evolved. The viruses evolved, the bacteria evolved, the quacks have evolved as well. You know, since public Punjab Healthcare Commission has started raiding all these quacks, they have evolved. They have found different means to survive. For example, some of the quacks, since I've been doing research for this presentation, some of the quacks, they have basically have their clinic registered with the names of some of the doctors and they're doing their own quackery. I think the solution is the solution is to finish the room. Where is the room? Where are they sitting? I think they are sitting where we lack something. Where are we lacking something? I think, I think we are lacking in basic communication skills. The many GPs out there that don't have the good communication skills, they don't convey to the patient that what is right for them, what is wrong for them. The way a quack is approaching, I think he is doing much much better at communication skills than what we can. Once we are equipped with the proper communication skills, all the GPs are trained properly and we are treating the patient the way they would like to be treated, I think we'll get rid of all this quackery. The only reason patients are going through the quacks, they think quacks are better at treating these conditions than us. I think money is the secondary issue. The main issue is the communication skills here. Ma'am Hina, would you like to add something here? Um, I think you've, you've just uh, echoed my thoughts there, uh, what you've said. I think we need to, as, as general practitioners, we need to raise our game. There are no two ways about it. Um, and, and also, um, the quackery can be approached through many ways, for example, prescription writing, um, if there are rules and regulations. The rules and regulations do exist. It is just uh, the implementation which is 
uh, some way or the other not, not being achieved. Um, the prescription writing, particularly for things like steroids or third generation cephalosporins, or even the basic penicillins, they should be restricted only by a registered medical practitioner. That is another way of stopping quackery. Um, so there are lots of ways and the solutions are there. It's just, we need somebody who can just take the initiative of uh, implementing them. The rules exist, they are in the books, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anna. Uh... I have a comment uh, while uh, Dr. Romeo was mentioning about the communication skill. I totally agree that we need to improve the communication skill. But uh, uh, as, far, uh, as far as my experience is concerned, I thought uh, I have just realized it's very difficult to counsel the patients uh, like we are seeing at Indus. They're coming from the, the rural areas yeah. because they have got the Tika injection wala mindset. Ke when they get the injections, only then the symptoms will be relieved timely. No matter how much you counsel them, no matter how much counsel them that no antibiotics are needed right now, but they will go back to them. So despite effective communication and everything, uh, I, I always feel that we fail here and the qu quackery win. And secondly, uh, uh, exactly. uh, as a one point, I'll answer that because that is a behavior change because all their life, this is what they have got. Like when we were doing telemedicine, providing services at UHS, we ended, we had a call from a very uh, low socioeconomic area. And uh, the chap at the end of a day, he, at the end of the line, he said to me, it was a simple allergy case. Uh, uh, chronic rhinitis and this kind of thing. And he told me that I would give a quack of steroids here. He told me everything. And when I explained to him that he didn't do this, he didn't do this. So the first thing he said is that the first time we talked to a doctor. So the access of a trained doctor is not there. So what you're talking about is behavior change. And behavior change takes a lot of time. It takes decades. So... Uh, Uh, may I ask something or may I comment on this situation? Yes, please. Uh, uh, my, name is, uh, uh, my name is Vaidan. I'm from uh, Aga Khan Hospital. Uh, this is very common if we visit uh, uh, rural areas, remote areas of uh, Sindh as well, that uh, uh, Thali. Uh, mafia is very active. Their thalies means they infuse uh, drip instead of uh, any considering any infection or any uh, justification regarding that. So I would encourage that uh, as a, a doctor, Tariq Aziz has mentioned that we need to uh, make a, a good infrastructure of uh, uh, family physician uh, among family physician uh, involving all the uh, uh, other you know, uh, our fellows with us to make a, a good infrastructure so that we can easily highlight uh, such type of area where uh, this type of practice uh, happens and uh, this causes more drug resistance and more complication to the patient. So that's, that's my point. Comment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, Dr. Akhtar has a question. Uh, he's asking, how can someone get referral charges from specialists? So, if uh, any of the panelists can answer. Yes, I mentioned earlier that people who are specialists, they don't give any referral charges, mostly. So, it's the people who are running the setup, they give the charges. So I don't know any good practitioner or any good specialist who will give you any charges. Dr. Hina, if you want to uh, add anything to this. Um, can I just uh, ask for some more clarity? What telling us that this is happening? Uh, your voice uh, can I say breaking. something? Okay, now your voice is breaking. 
So we couldn't hear you properly. Looks like our uh, internet connections are not very good at the moment. I got disconnected earlier. Um, I think it's kind of an individual thing. Probably if you have made some arrangements with the referring person, I remember. Can I say something? Because I can't hear anybody. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Tariq, you can add because I think we can't hear Dr. Hena. Yeah, we can always, uh, in a polyclinic where we have our own patients and there is a ENT or eye specialist or surgeon available or even gynecologist, we can always take the 30 or 40 percent chunk of that fee because that is part of our polyclinic. So that is very, I think, very justified because if you're running a polyclinic and you are having some uh, specialist along with you, and you make a referral to them in your clinic, you always have a right to charge a certain percentage depending upon the arrangements you have made for them. So that would be really justified. And if you are charging any commission to, uh, by referring a, a surgeon or a eye or ENT specialist at a different place, that is slightly different matter. And that can be uh, just the understanding between uh, the family physician and those particular people, how they manage it, because uh, Ultimately, the good should be uh, the part of the treatment to the patient. Something, uh, some proper referrals should be made, which should actually help our patients and uh, make their life easy. And that, that, that should be a simple referral with actually a follow-up. And then the specialist should send the patient back to the family physician. The system should be like that. And I suppose charging for a for a a consultation or an inpatient care in the doctor's own vicinity or in his own clinic is justified because that is because you are providing that that place to a specialist and also the inpatient care is being at your is being done at your hospital or a polyclinic thank you okay, let me add to this uh, what dr tariq has said you know pmdc pakistan medical council dental council does not allow you to take any money for referrals so what Dr. Tariq Aziz is talking about is when you have your own polyclinic and one of the specialists who is basically occupying one of the rooms, he sees any patient, you get some charges from it. So that's a bit different from referrals. When you make referrals, I think it's unethical, unlegal. You shouldn't be taking any referral monies because again, that is a slippery slope. Where do you stop? If you're like in two minds, instead, instead of like, giving the next medicine, you say, okay, let's refer this patient, I'll automatically get some money. I think that is the reason PMDC does not allow it. But if you are running a polyclinic, obviously somebody sees ENT specialist, sees a patient, that is part of your business. Obviously you're going to charge the money. So that is not the referral. Well, I think the question of Dr. Akhtar Munir was. So that kind of referral, good physicians, they don't give you any cut from it at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that uh, brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romeo, Dr. Tariq Aziz, and Dr. Hina for joining us today. I think I cannot thank you all enough. I think this was a very wonderful and a fruitful discussion where everyone contributed. And this was a one valid and a very interesting discussion also at the same time and very much needed also uh, in this uh, hour. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, again, uh, for joining us today. And thank you to all the participants for joining us. And thanks. Thanks once again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.